Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special Together San Diego webinar on the state of Hispanic home ownership in San Diego. I'm Luis Cruz, Community and Public Relations Director for the San Diego Union Tribune. We're excited to present this three free three-part series with NAREP, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. We know owning real estate is a key factor in building generational wealth, and although home ownership among Hispanics is growing at an exciting pace, some challenges remain. In this session, we'll explore how factors such as income, migration data, and housing affordability impact Hispanic home ownership rates and growth across our region. Joining me to talk about how to conquer the complex home buying experience is Nuerena Limon, Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Industry Relations at NAREP, and Imelda Manzo, broker owner of Premier One Realtors, past president for NAREP Temecula Valley, and regional director for NAREP's National Advocacy Committee. Thank you both for joining us for this important discussion. And for those of you who are tuning in, we want to thank you as well. Nuerena and Imelda will go over some interesting facts and figures for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Remember to please put your question in the Q&A field so we can clearly see the questions. Imelda, I'll turn, turn it over to you. Thank you, Luis. Good morning, everyone. Muy buenos días a todos. First of all, I want to thank you, Luis, NP, Ona, and everybody at the San Diego Union Tribune for this opportunity to participate in this important discussion about Latino home ownership. It is an honor to be here with everyone and to be here with my good friend, Mrs. Norena Limon. Again, my name is Imelda Manso. I am the broker owner of Premier One Realtors. I have been practicing real estate since 2004. I have been around NARIT for over a decade already. And I'm proud to say that this organization has been the heartbeat of not only my career, but also my ability to change lives of people through home ownership. I was one of the founding directors, as you mentioned, for Temecula Valley, where I served as president in 2019, to now being a regional director for NARC's National Advocacy Committee, where I serve the greater San Diego area. A little background about NARIP. We are the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. We are a national trade association headquartered here in San Diego with the mission to advance sustainable home ownerships for our Latinos. As we are passionately focused on bridging the widening wealth gap here in America. Next slide, please. Yeah, something that I look forward to every year is the release of our annual State of Hispanic Home Ownership Report, which gets released every spring. I think that as real estate professionals, we experience the trends that are illustrated in this report, but it's very different to actually see the data, to see how Latinos are faring when it comes to home ownership growth, and to see the areas of concern in the area and where the areas of opportunity are. But one of my favorite data points that I always like to use is this data point right here, which truly underscores the, the power of home ownership and building generational wealth that can be passed from one generation to another. So Norena, can you please talk to us about this 28 times the wealth number? Imelda, thank you so much. And first of all, it's so exciting to have this conversation with you, especially because you know, you know, we uh, chat about this all the time uh, in our own time. We're very passionate about home ownership and want to thank uh, the San Diego Union Tribune for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about this important topic. So to your point, Imelda, I also think this data point is extremely powerful. Uh, we've calculated what is called household wealth. So we look at household wealth, that's net worth, that's the value of all of our assets minus our liabilities. And Latino homeowners have 28 times the wealth as Latino renters. That's huge. That means that Latino households who have been able to purchase a home have a median household wealth of just over $170,000 compared to only $6,000. 
This really underscores the seismic economic leaps a family can make through owning a home. And granted, this is based off, the, off of the survey of consumer finances from the Federal Reserve. And the latest that we have, latest data that we have is 2019. It's released every three years. So if the median household wealth of a, of a Latino uh, owner household is 170,000. You can just imagine the amount, how much that's grown because uh, home equity appreciation has been so drastic between 2020 and 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Emilda, if I, if I can just jump in Absolutely. real quick. So, um, so is that you? You alluded to that, but is that the primary reason? Is it because of that home equity that makes it? Uh, that's sense. exactly right. That's okay. exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, that is the primary way that uh, that uh, regular Americans, working class families build wealth in the U.S. It's through building that home equity. Right. Yeah. Thank and, you. and when I read that having the, the medium net worth, and I think your exact numbers in the report note right now were one. 71,900 versus 6,210 for, for renters. I mean, that just really highlights how important it is that we continue to help our Latinos build generational wealth and home ownership, you know, is the safest vehicle to get there. Um, I think that we could all agree that home ownership has been the number one strategy for regular Americans that have used, that have built wealth through, through, gener through generations by buying homes. People like our immigrant parents or fields that work in the field, you know, to be able to to build wealth through this asset that is so central to who we are as people, as familia. Would you agree, Norena? Yeah, I mean, this is how my family build wealth. You know, my family, my, my dad owned a tree trimming business. This is how working class Americans have been able to build wealth. You don't have to be a corporate executive. Uh, historically, you didn't have to be a corporate executive to become a homeowner. Uh, yet, you know, home price uh, appreciation and home equity is so critical to that wealth creation. Yeah, but, but sadly, I'm going to have to say, you know, that access to home ownership, you know, has been out of reach to a, to a lot of people, you know, because they don't have access to, to any type of generational wealth. But on a positive note, I would like to add that in my experience as a real estate broker, um, and, and knowing that this has been, in my opinion, one of the most hostile markets, especially for our first time home buyers, that's, is that we did have a lot of buyers that did not give up. You know, they did whatever it took to make their dream of buying a home come true. Um, they wrote numerous offers. I mean, we're talking waiving all kinds of contingencies, um, switching their FHA loan to a conventional loan, you know, because the competition was just so, so crazy out there. And we continue to see that, even though I have seen a little bit of a slowdown, but I'm going to have to say that despite the challenges, you know, through grit and resilience, you know, many Latinos did make it in, and found a way to become homeowners. You know, sadly, we do have, you know, the other side where a lot of them just gave up, you know, they just couldn't compete with these cash buyers, you know, investors, conventional buyers that were putting bigger down payments in. Sadly, they, they continue. There's a, a big percentage of people that continue to be homeowners. Would, would you agree with that? Is that what you saw um, in your findings, Norena? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if we look at um, the homeownership rate, so if we go to the next slide, um, I want to talk about you know, what's happened. Uh, and, and that's essentially the, the, the number that we uh, release and we base our entire report on is on understanding how Latinos are faring year after year. After year. And with the census, we're able to do that. We're able to, to track how Latinos are doing. Uh, so, um, you know, as of 2021, the national Latino homeownership rate increased to 48.4%. This means that for the past seven years, there's been a consistent increase in Latino home ownership. It's actually, Latinos have been the only demographic to have increased for seven consecutive years. Uh, and, and that's a big thing. You know, this is this is compared to a 65.5% home ownership rate for the general population and 74.1% uh, for the non-Hispanic white population. This is national. Now let's go a little bit, uh, a little bit more local. Let's go to California. Uh, the Latino home ownership rate in California is 43.5. So that's below the 48, 
uh, that we have nationally. But in terms of the Latino homeownership rate, California ranks 33rd in the nation in terms of its Latino homeownership rate. And it actually, California as a whole ranks second to last in the country in terms of the overall homeownership rate. The only state that is worse off than California in terms of a homeownership rate is New York. Uh, so that's that's California. Let's go a little bit. Let's go. Let's go home now. So it's San Diego. So remember, forty eight point four percent nationally. Uh, we have forty three point five percent statewide for Latinos in San Diego. The Latino homeownership rate is thirty nine point seven percent. So this is compared to fifty two point six percent for the general general uh, population. Uh, the non-Hispanic white population is at 57.2%, so not too different from the general population, uh, but that is far below what we're seeing nationwide for, for the Latino community. It has gone up. So if we look at 2018, uh, the homeownership rate here in San Diego was 38.3%, so it has gone up slightly. Uh, but this was a really striking number for me. Uh, in 2018, there are there were uh, be, between now and 2018. Sorry, since 2018, there are now 15,310 fewer Latino owner households. So San Diego actually lost the most Latino homeowners of all markets in the state, and it was the Inland Empire that gained the most new Latino homeowners in the market. Is this uh, is this consistent to, to what you're seeing, Imelda? How, how do you react to that? Yes, yes, definitely. Well, I, I know a lot of them, some of them, you know, are, are coming here. Um, but one of the questions that I want to ask you regarding these rates, Norena, is do you think that at this at this rate, Latinos could possibly reach a 50 percent home ownership rate um, by the year 2025? And I guess this would be more at, at a national level, right? Yeah, I don't think we'll get there at the San Diego by that time or or in California, but nationally, I think we will. Uh, if we are consistent with the trend that we've been seeing uh, over the past seven years, then we will definitely reach uh, a 50% homeownership rate by that uh, by that year. And that's a goal that we've set as NARA uh, to hit that majority homeowner uh, number that we've been aspiring to. However, there are uh, huge obstacles with housing inventory crisis and interest rates rising uh, that might slow down the rates that we've been seeing. But every two years, what we've been seeing nationally is that the Latino homeownership rate increases by one percentage points. Uh, so if we do continue with that rate, I do think that we will hit it. Right. Yeah. And I, I, one of the things that I am seeing is that, you know, a lot of, you know, people that want to buy in San Diego, obviously they, they, they can't afford these prices anymore. So they are needing to get more borrowers or more families to be added on their loans in, in order to qualify. Or a lot of them are giving up the idea of just buying in San Diego altogether and moving to areas like Temecula or surrounding cities. And then we have the people in the Temecula Valley that are, that are starting to move, you know, further east. Um, and some of them are just giving up on the idea of buying a house and, and focusing on, on ADUs now, now that it's become a little bit more flexible for them to build an ADU to try to keep their families together. You know, obviously in the last few months, we saw rates going up and that's also made a lot of buyers, you know, hit the brakes. And then we have the buyers that have the, uh, the uncertainty of, you know, whether the market's going to crash again, like it did in 2008. Or, or people are saying, no, let's move out of state, let's go to other states like, like Texas where houses are more affordable. And you know, we, we have a lot of uncertainty with, um, with buyers right now on whether deciding if today is the best time to buy it because they think there's gonna be a market crash like in 2008. What is your opinion on that? Are you hearing anything um, around those lines? So we are living, yes, uh, the, we hear that from buyers, especially a lot, but but I want to underscore, we are living in, ex, in an extremely different environment than we were uh, back in 2008. Uh, we have such a severe underproduction of housing uh, that we are not going to see the drops in, in home prices that we saw back in between 2009 and 2012. Uh, we uh, what we are going to what economists expect is that there is going to be a, a slowdown in the appreciation we've seen in homes. 
So uh, between 20, 2020, 2021, uh, the San Diego market uh, increased, uh, had a home price appreciation of above 20%. Uh, we're not going to see something, we're not going to see double digits uh, in terms of the home price appreciation, but we're also not going to see a decline in home prices. I agree. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, one, one of the things, Norena, that I always hear you say is that Latinos are still driving home ownership um, and household formations. Um, is, is that still our case right now? Yeah, so, so if you look at this slide, uh, you know, we've been talking about this for a really long time. You know, since the since the Great Recession, Latinos actually drove home ownership and household formation growth at a time when the non-Hispanic white population was actually losing owner households. And in, in terms of demographic projections, this is actually consistent to where the nation needs to be in order for there to be a healthy real estate market and in turn a healthy U.S. economy. Uh, if we look at the age of the Latino population, Latinos are uh, have a median age of 30. This is considered prime home buying years, almost 14 years younger uh, than the uh, than the non-Hispanic white population. So in order, if we look at, at, at the age and household formations, if we look at demographics, uh, Latinos should be driving house uh, home ownership growth. However, in a sharp reversal of trends, and I'm saying that because of demographics, uh, but in a sharp reversal of trends since 2017, it's actually been the non-Hispanic white population that has driven growth in both of these categories. And this pendulum shift coincides with historic drops in housing inventory. In fact, in 2021, it dipped to as low as 2.3 months supply, which is the lowest that's ever been recorded. And what we believe has happened, uh, and we see it in the market, and Melda can speak to it, is that many Latino would-be first-time home buyers have just been priced out. And those who could rely on generational wealth uh, to put you know, larger down payments, mm -hmm. Uh, they were just in a better position to take advantage of those low interest rates of the past two years. Right, and um, next slide. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the, pop, the migration and pop, population yeah. slide? Yeah, and I want to go back a little bit to what I said in terms of the demographic projections. You know, we talked about why it is that that. Uh, the real estate market, and we look at the country, why we're going to rely on Latinos continue to be a big share of that new homeowner demographics. Uh, this is especially true in California. Latinos were responsible for 68.6% .6 of California's population growth over the past 10 years. And, and so that means that the vast majority of Cap California's population growth can be attributed to Latinos. And I also want to talk about migration. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, there's been a lot of talk about migration patterns, especially people leaving California because of the home prices. We did a lot of qualitative interviews and folks in, in that were moving to Texas were saying, I'm moving from California to Texas because I want to be able to buy a home. Uh, and, and as California is experiencing this exodus, San Diego is actually still growing, if you see from this slide. Is that what you're seeing, Imelda? Yes, and, and and I agree. Even though a lot of people, what we're seeing is a lot of people have left or continue to leave California to more affordable states. Texas is one of the popular ones. We have Tennessee, Nevada, Arizona, um, where housing is it's more affordable, where they could buy that house with the big lanchito or the big backyard that they all want that we no longer seem to be able to find here, right? Um, but I, I do see that San Diego is, is continues to grow. Um, we we continue to see, like you said earlier, you know, younger and younger buyers that are mortgage ready, but you know, sadly, we we can't tell them what's not for sale, and we can't tell them something that they can't afford because the prices are way out of their out of their budget. Um, some of them are still living with friends or family rent free just to try to save up their money. Um, they're taking extra hours at work, taking you know extra jobs, anything that they could do. To, to make this, this, this dream of home ownership come true. Some kids, we're beginning to see kids are moving back in with their parents. I'm sure you, you've heard that from other realtors that that's what they're doing, you know, all these millennials. Um, and also happy to share that one of the things that I, that I read in the report, uh, a study that was done by Freddie Mac, that Latinos are becoming more credit savvy 
which I think is huge. Um, right now, I believe our medium score for our Latinos is like 668, according to Freddie Mac. And I think that's going to be huge um, because it's going to give them better opportunities to, to negotiate better finance terms in their, in their home loan. But, you know, we must fix our housing crisis, Norena. We, um, this could result in a huge decline in future home ownership rate, in my opinion, yeah. and as well as the well-being of, of our economy. So can you share, Norena, um, how Latinos were disproportionately impacted um, by this low housing inventory? And if we could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and before we get there, Imelda, you said something that is uh, very profound to me. You know, when when people think about, um, you know, how to address Latino home ownership, I always talk about housing supply. Housing supply is the number one barrier, without a doubt, that Latinos are facing. I'm going to leave you with one data point. If you don't, rem if you forget everything we've said today, I'm going to leave you with one data point. I want you to remember. We did a study with Freddie Mac, NARP and Freddie Mac, and we actually calculated that there are, in the country, there are 8.3 million Latinos under 45 who are mortgage ready and don't have a mortgage right now. So that means that these are individuals who aren't homeowners, uh, probably because they can't buy a home uh for sale. You know, they can't, you can't buy what's not for sale. The housing inventory crisis is, is without a doubt, the most pressing issue that Latinos are facing on their road towards uh, wealth creation. And no state is there a more severe housing crisis than in California. This is the country's most populous Latino state. And two of the top 10 markets seeing the highest home price, uh, price appreciation in the country are in California. So let's look, I talked a little bit about home price appreciation um, happening here in San Diego. So between 2021 and 2022, San Diego saw a 23.3% wow. increase in home price appreciation. I mean, that's amazing. If you're a homeowner, I'm a homeowner. I was able to buy a house in 2020. That's great for me, but for first time home buyers, that is a drastic spike in uh, the, the home prices that they're, you know, they're on in the market one year uh, in, uh, you know, a few months, they get completely priced out of different neighborhoods and different neighborhoods. Uh, so, um, you know, that is, that is a huge number. We do believe that that is going to, that home price appreciation will not be as large, uh, particularly because demand is going to decrease a little bit because of the increase in, in uh, interest rates. Uh, but this really shows the big discrepancies that exist between the median household income of Latino families and the income needed to be able to afford the median price home. So if you look at San Diego, the income you need to afford the median price home is $167,000. Wow. <laughs> Well, the median household income for Latinos is only 62500 in the San Diego market. It's actually the second highest discrepancy in California, only second to the astronomical prices in San Diego. So um, that is that. Those are some huge numbers. Uh, also, a new report released by Up for Growth, which is a nonprofit, uh, national nonprofit dedicated on uh, to uh, work on housing supply. They found that the San Diego market has experienced a severe worsening of housing under production. So, in 2012. They calculated a number, uh, which is the amount of units that should have been produced, right? In 2012, San Diego's underproduction was already bad. It was at 25,000, a little bit over 25,000 units, right? In 2019, San Diego's uh, underproduction number went up to 68,000 units. So that is a massive amount of underproduction that happened here in the market of San Diego. Wow, those, those numbers are huge. And this income requirements, you know, I know I've had buyers where I've had to put two, three, sometimes even four people just to meet the income requirements to qualify for a loan, which is really sad because not everybody has, you know, that many people in their family that are that that have the credit criteria to be able to be added to a loan. Um, and the underproduction, yes, I agree, it's massive, but you know, we do have obviously the the labor shortages that are contributing to this. The high material, the high cost of materials like lumber and steel, and the limited building permits um, have only aggravated the problem even more. 
Um, we just aren't building enough houses, especially at the entry level. And from what I remember, you know, what you said earlier, um, did you say we had, we're short about 3.8 homes um, relative to, to demand? Is that, is that what you said? 8.3? Did I hear that? 3.8 million. Oh, 3.8 3 million. Yeah. I yeah. That, that was a, yeah. That's, that's huge. 3.8 million is just a huge number. Um, Absolutely, Melda. And, and, and to that point, I mean, there is a lot of work to solve. There's a lot of good work happening here in San Diego to for, on housing production, but we're not building homes for sale, <laughs> when, especially at that entry level condo, townhomes. That is the product that is the most underproduced uh, in the market today. I mean, there is a whole host of reasons why that's happening, but that is if we want to see a um, a spike in, in in these numbers that we're talking about right now, we're going to have to build more homes. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Well, we could go to the next slide. I would like for you to talk about the, the video awards that we experienced in, yeah. in 2021. So I, we want to paint a picture to, to on what happens, why housing supply is uh, is so um, so important to the conversation around homeownership growth. You know, to paint a picture of the realities faced by many first time home buyers. Uh, there was a survey done by Realtor.com that said that 69% of Latinos uh, took part in a bidding war in 2021. So we did a survey, a national survey of our practitioners who reported that the average home in their market received between six and 20 offers. In San Diego, the highest number of offers reported was about 34 for a single home in San Diego. How bad has it gotten in, in some of the markets you've seen? Imoda. Oh God, um, I would say <laughs> the average has been about 25. Mm -hmm. um, and sadly, these, these bidding awards um, that were just getting out of control, they pretty much came down to the one with the most cash wins, right? Yeah. The one that removed the most, if not all their contingencies were the ones that were getting better chances of getting their offer accepted. You know, but our entry level buyers are the ones that are using your your traditional FHA or down payment assistance program um, were put in a bad position where they had no negotiating power and they were at higher risk. So a lot of these buyers, you know, they couldn't compete with 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 these um, these um, buyers that were coming in with cash that were coming in with you know bigger down payments, and it pretty much came down most the one with the most cash is the one that's going to win. Yeah. I mean, in San Diego, 27.5% of homes sold over asking. So you can look at that number and say, you know, okay, yeah, there's a lot of home price appreciation. But the issue here is that if you actually got your offer accepted and you are purchasing a home over asking, that means that the difference in the appraised value uh, and what it was sold for has to come out of pocket. That's not going to be financed by your mortgage. That has to be cash somehow. And if you think about the fact that these individuals are already just going out of their way to save their pennies, to be able to put as large of a down payment as they possibly can so that they can get the offer accepted, that's tough. That's going to be tough on that first time home buyer. Yes, no, I agree. And and I remember, you know, getting a lot of these counter offers where it clearly read, you know, buyer must agree to, you know, waive the appraisal contingency and must show proof that they have enough reserves in the bank to pay any discrepancy in the appraisal value. I mean, it was just putting these buyers in a, in a very bad position and pretty much they were being wiped out of the uh, out of the game. You know, they had no chance of getting an offer accepted. And like I said, we continue to have a lot of those buyers that continue to be renters because of this stuff. And then with FHA, another thing that I know is, you know, there's that misconception that if you're an FHA buyer, you know, the FHA appraisers are pickier, that, you know, the transaction is gonna be a lot slower, um, that they're going to ask for conditions or repair. So that was another thing that was, you know, affecting our buyers that were trying to finance and buy a home using a, a you know, FHA product. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's something that we, um, you know, we've been working, uh, and, and there's a lot of myths associated with that. There is nothing that makes an FHA product uh, less um uh, you know, preferable than a conventional loan. So there's a lot of myths that we need to dispel about FHA versus conventional. We'll talk about that later um, in the Q&A. would love to go uh, a little bit deeper on that, but um, we've been speaking very closely with 
uh, our um, representatives at HUD nationally, but FHA product was made to help mm -hmm. first time home buyers become homeowners. It's, it's a critical, uh, it's a critical product that has uh, ensured that many uh, homeowners become homeowners and start to build generational wealth with low down payment. But, but with all of this, I do want to talk about one thing um, that we haven't spoken about another barrier. We go to the next slide. This is something that keeps me up at night because aside from the fact that we're not building enough homes and, and it is a, a, an equity issue, it's not only an equity, you build equity, but it's a, a racial and ethnic equity issue given the fact that it's, it's, it's folks of color that are the most disproportionately impacted by not having enough homes for sale. Uh, but there's this issue of institutional investors. Mm -hmm. It's like a boat with, with, with a, you know, with holes in the bottom of the ship, you know, we're seeing that a lot of Latino would be home buyers are losing a significant portion of housing stock to institutional investors. So if we look at the San Diego market in, in the third quarter of last year, we saw that 32% of homes uh, sold went to investors. Uh, wow. Is that something that you saw, Emilda? Yes, we're seeing a lot of um, cash buyers coming investors and just wiping everybody out. You know, a, a, a good percentage of them were always investors. So, and, and a lot of the homes that investors purchase are, um, you know, more on the entry level. I mean, they're yes. going to buy on the, the lower end of the market, which are, is, is the type of product that uh, for some home buyers buy. So, um, so that is something that we'll, we'll chat a little bit more. Um, in the Q&A, but I just want to finish this off and, and say that, you know, as uh, I want to bring it back to that uh, power of, of Latino uh, homeowners have 28 times the wealth as Latino renters. So if we go to the next slide, you know, I, I just want to underscore that, yes, we are a Latino organization. Uh, this is why our data focuses on the Latino population. But this is actually a California issue. Over the past decade, Latinos accounted for 68.6% .6 of the population growth in California, and projections are only going to continue. If we look at uh, a report that was released a few years ago by the Urban Institute, which is a national think tank, uh, they predict that Latinos are going to account for 70% of homeownership growth over the past 20 years. But this is a demographic projection and a projection that underscores how much uh, the economy and the real estate market needs Latinos to become, to drive that first time home buyer market. But, you know, inventory challenges have to be solved and the U.S. housing and home lending industries have to create an environment that is more conducive to first time home buyers, especially for communities of color. Yes, I, I totally agree, agree with you, Norena. And just like our buyers, you know, care about these barriers that we're going through, just like San Diego cares. I, I know me and you are very passionate about this. Um, you know, everyone should care, right? Because it, it is it is an issue for for everybody. And when I when I I, I still have that number, seventy percent. You know, studies done by the Urban Institute. I mean, seventy percent of home ownership over the next twenty years, even though it is like you said by demographic. I mean, that is a huge huge number. Um, and I just hope that we do, like you said, that we that we fix this housing um, shortage that we have and that they do something that's more conducive to our buyers. So thank you, Norena. It looks like um, I think this was the last of our slides. So thank you so much for sharing this, this information and for doing such an amazing job um, year after year publishing this report with this important data. Um, I just hope that our inventory challenges get solved soon. And I'm going to pass it back to Luis in case we have any questions from our audience. We do. We have a lot of great questions uh, in the Q&A field. So thank you for those of you who tuned in and are asking those questions. Before we get to that, I do want to ask, uh, you know, you both mentioned it's a tough market out there. So what advice would you have for that first time home buyer? I can take that one, Lorena. Well, um, to be ready, right? To be as, as ready as possible. Um, writing offers, it's important not just for the buyer, but for the real estate agent to be able to structure that offer to make sure that these buyers are truly pre-approved, not just pre-qualified, that they're working with a seasoned lender that knows the ins and outs. Everybody has unique situations. 
you know, I work with a lot of buyers that still believe in, in saving their money under the mattress, you know? So I'm always ex- like, I always have like, I, I interview them and I ask them, you know, where is your money coming from? Is it in the bank? I need to see the bank statements. Um, teaching them and educating them on, on the products available that fit their particular needs. Everybody has different needs. You know, sometimes an FHA may not be the best product. Sometimes we can push them to, um, to conventional. And, and just uh, making sure they understand, um, you know, the, the whole process, but being really pre-approved, knowing what they're getting, what their payment's going to be at the end of the day, you know, with our Latino, especially, you know, they, all they care about is what is my payment going to be, you know, my PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance, right? So just being pre-approved, having their money in the bank mm-hmm. and just, you know, working with the right agent that's going to help them structure and negotiate that offer. Great, great. Thank you. All right, let's go over to some of the questions that are being asked in the uh, Q&A box. Um, Adriana says, thank you for this discussion. What incentives can local cities implement to increase home ownership, especially in predominantly Latino communities? We got to build more homes. (laughs) Uh, I think there needs to be, uh, we need to figure out uh, programs within the city to build more townhomes and, and more condos. Um, that is entry-level housing. Uh, I do want to say that any sort of building um, adds to the housing stock because uh, theoretically, even if you are building a larger home, uh, that, per- the, 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 that person is able to purchase that larger home and put that home for sale that they currently own. So anything that's added right now is going to be, um, is going to help but I think uh, what the city really needs to do is work on incentives or how do we ensure that we are developing um, that housing product for entry level uh, homeowners, condos, uh, townhomes, um, specifically in, um, you know, in areas where um, where we can, you know, afford the land. So I think uh, anything that could be done on uh, on that end is going to be a good thing. Okay. There's there's also a lot of how do we promote the production of of um you know we pass SB9 and SB10 uh in in the state how do we ensure that people are using those critical zoning changes I know there's been a lot of activity about that in here in San Diego but uh the building of in the, of of ADUs is always going to make home ownership more affordable because that is future income that could be used uh, to pay for uh, for the monthly payment. Uh, we could purchase uh, lots, uh, larger lots and subdivide them uh, in, in those homes, those individual four lots in, in units will be more affordable. Um, so those are all uh, of the various tools that we have available. We just need to ensure that there are incentives and the additional red tape uh, that's associated with uh, what's preventing the building or the taking adva- uh, you know, benefiting from those zoning changes that we fully utilize them and, and we are building more homes. Right. I think that answers uh, Raphael's question who had uh, who mentioned it was an opportunity um, for some more affordable inventory and home ownership opportunities. So that's exactly right. Um, let's say uh, here's another question. Many cities are addressing the housing demand by removing density caps and increasing rentals. How do you see this impacting the ability of the underserved community to build long term sustainable wealth? We have, let's be, let's be real. We have a, um, we have an affordable housing crisis across the board. We do not have enough affordable housing. We do not have enough market rate housing, and we definitely don't have entry level housing for home ownership. Uh, so we need to build more housing across the board. Uh, and the restrictive zoning, uh, you know, zoning laws that we've had for years have made it very difficult to build uh, more homes for, especially folks on the lower end of the income level. But uh, but I am seeing one of the things that I am worried about is that I am seeing that all of the activity that's happening uh, around uh, housing production is happening at the rental level, which I want to underscore is extremely important. Uh, and it is, and affordable housing is extremely important and we need it. Uh, but we also cannot forget about that entry level 
uh, housing because we're else we're, we're relegating individuals to only having an option to rent and not build wealth. Um, I don't know if Melda, if, if you're seeing uh, what you're seeing out in the market, but that's one of the things that I'm concerned about. And I, I want to challenge everybody that's listening here uh, on this call who cares about housing, uh, that they don't put their, um, you know, their foot off the pedal when it comes to pushing our uh, elected officials to ensure that we facilitate the building of home ownership housing as well. Yes, and I'm going to kind of um, echo on, on that and say that, yes, it's important, you know, regardless of what community you live in, that you don't take your foot off the pedal like Nora and I say, and that you go speak up and get to meet who your elected officials are in your community. It's so important and crucial that we build those relationships and that we go speak up and address what's concerning us, what's affecting our community, because that's the only way we're going to make changes happen but we have to speak up. And as Latinos, I think sometimes we tend to like hold off on doing stuff like that, but it's super, super important that we get to know who they are. I mean, we, we're the ones that vote for them at the end of the day. So we should be able to know what they're doing for us, for our people. So that's super important. Here's another question here. Is NAREP collaborating with other real estate trade associations, organizations, or groups to demand something to be done to address the needs of the underserved communities to increase home ownership? You never do anything alone, ever. <laughs> we always do everything in coalitions because there is a power in numbers and it is, it's very powerful when organizations come together uh, to, to advocate on certain issues. So yes, we work uh, in here in California, we work in collaboration with, uh, we're part of the Home Building Alliance. Uh, that is a group of advocacy organizations that are all pushing on host housing production. We work with the other real estate uh, associations as well, the National Association of Realtors, National Association of Real Estate Brokers, uh, ARIA, uh, which is our, our Asian American counterpart. Uh, we work with the other real estate associations, but we also work with uh, national organizations uh, such as the National Fair Housing Alliance, uh, Center for Responsible Lending, I mean, and essentially anyone who's working on uh, on bridging the home ownership gaps, we're all working together. We're a pretty close knit community, uh, and we, um, you know, have been uh, pushing historically for a down payment, a national down payment program uh, that is created for first time, first generation home buyers. Because uh, if we, we're going to be talking about uh, building generational wealth, that's the population that really needs that extra down payment assistance program. We've been working together to try to pass something uh, something like that nationally. Uh, we've been um, also working on creating more special purpose credit programs uh, that will facilitate home ownership. And uh, how do we create incentives at the national level to ensure that cities are easing zoning restrictions? Uh, so we were working all year long on uh, creating new uh, ways that we can pass um, uh, that we can pass national legislation on easing zoning restrictions. And here in California, you know, obviously we were uh, we were a part of the coalition that pushed to pass SB nine and SB ten. Uh, and, and now we need to just utilize them. We need to ensure that we have the, the capital and we have access to capital. We have incentives for those ADUs to be built uh, and that we are taking advantage of the lot subdivisions in order to create more housing stock. Along those lines, Carlos is asking, are there programs, organizations, government agencies that offer grants and are home loans that are only awarded to Latinos? And if so, what are those options? There are no programs that are only awarded to Latinos uh, that I know of. Imelda, do you know of any? Uh, no. <laughs> no, but but um, that is uh, along the lines. There are programs for um, you know certain incomes. Um, there are. I mean, the FHA product was created for individuals that are starting off on their wealth on their wealth journey. Uh, it is how uh, individuals that have accumulated generational wealth built wealth. Uh, especially after uh, World War II, the FHA product was instrumental in, in um, you know, the individuals that came from, uh, from the war to 
to build wealth. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of redlining that happened uh, after that, but um, the FHA product has been instrumental for, uh, for people of color. And there's also uh, conventional loans that are low down payment products uh, that individuals can use. You know, one of the biggest misconceptions is that you need 20% uh, 20% to receive a mortgage. That's not true. Uh, you uh, at least need a 3.5% down payment. Uh, the, the issue is more of uh, getting your offer accepted in today's uh, today's environment. But to get a mortgage, uh, you need um, you can do a low down payment. Uh, but there are we've been pushing more for these programs, like I was saying before, like the special purpose credit programs or uh, down payment assistance for first generation home buyers, but there is no Latino specific product out there. Yeah, but I would like to piggyback and, and, and add to that, Norena and Luis, that um, I'd be surprised, I'm surprised that, you know, there's still a lot of Latino buyers out there that don't know that we have FHA and then we have like FHA down payment assistance programs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of them don't know that these programs exist. They just think they they have to go either conventional, come up with this huge down payment, 20%, like Norena mentioned. Um, so a lot of them don't know that there is such thing as down payment assistance, but you know, there, there is criteria to qualify. You have to be at a certain um, income level. It's not for everybody. So if, if I want to go buy, a, they want to go buy, or I want to go buy a house in Beverly Hills, you know, I'm not going to be able to use the down payment assistance program to buy a property there. So sometimes they're also by, by um, certain cities. So there's certain th areas where you're allowed to use a down payment assistance program. So uh, again, going to what I said earlier, it's important that they work with a seasoned lender that also understands the product and knows the ins and outs of, of down payment assistance programs. Because I feel like a lot of, of our Latinos um, don't know that or they only go get one opinion. I always tell my buyers, hey, get a second opinion and go with the one that you feel more comfortable with. But, um, but, but there is not one that's specifically geared towards Latinos. Okay. I uh, hear a couple of questions uh, from John related in regards to Senate Bills 9 uh, and 10. John says, please address why Senate Bills 9 and 10 promote big money investor ownership while reducing the supply of the smaller, older, single family starter homes people want through gentrification and high density infill. And then uh, John also comments, SB 9 has no provision for affordability. Uh, I guess that's a question there as well. Say, um, first of all, SB9 and SB10 um, ease zoning restrictions. One of the biggest, uh, I do, you know, one of the things that that's that's frustrating um, is that, you know, the, the what's is that I feel like there's a misunderstanding of what's causing the affordability crisis, right? It is just, it is a simple uh, supply and demand graph. You know, we do not have enough supply and we have a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. So every home is going to go for higher because there's more people competing for a single home. So anything that um, anything that produces more housing is going to uh, potentially reduce the price of the home and, and have the ability for uh, that first time home buyer to be able to compete for their first home. Um, so that is. Um, that is, that's something that is, um, I think, really important to understand. And one of the things that's, um, that it, it, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, incentivize a home builder to build affordable housing uh, for home ownership when you think about the fact that, uh, you know, materials are so expensive, the, um, you know, the, the permits take so long to, to, be able to build. So time is money. Uh, we have drastic labor shortages. So if you compound all of that in order to even build a home, I feel, I feel like the last um, the last statistic that I found is that to break ground and to actually build a home at cost, it's still about seven hundred thousand dollars in California. So uh, you know, unless there's heavy subsidies that are included. Uh, no builder is going to go in and, and build money and build a home that they're going to lose money on uh, or else why would they build? So there has to be incentives or there has to be heavy subsidies uh, for that to actually um, for that you know, home price to actually be affordable. 
And realistically, it's only if we add more to the pot that we're going to be able to reduce the prices uh, that we're seeing in the market today. Here's another question. What is being done to assure funds provided to the cities under affordable housing be allotted to home ownership and not rentals? It seems these uh, funds are rerouting into other options which do not help the community. Yeah, well, the issue is that there's a lot of incentives um, out that which there should be. You know, it's it's, it's uh, there's a lot of incentives that home builders have to build affordable housing, uh, like light tech uh, tax incentives. There isn't that equivalent incentive for building owner occupied. Uh, so we do um, we do need. Um, you know, there is the the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act uh, that we were, we've been pushing for nationwide. Uh, would create a tax incentive to either rehab uh, older properties uh, or to uh, you know, to do new uh, new home construction in specific neighborhoods, especially uh, neighborhoods that are um, you know have been historically disinvested in. Uh, so it's programs like that that are incredi incredibly important. The problem is that there is no existing investment. Uh, there's no in existing uh, incentives right now for the building of that product. Okay. Uh, Valerie says, I, I was able to buy my first home on my own in October of 2020. I had savings from my employment with no family support since I was 17. I'm the first in my family to be able to purchase a home as a single person. Now I'd like, yes. Now I'd like to take that next step into investment property and or commercial real estate but where can I go to for resources to learn more? I just feel that the community or resources are not available to us. And congratulations, Valerie. Amazing. Yes, congratulations. Well, you could call me directly and I'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my number is 951-265-3336. And I could, you know, lead you in the right direction Famous plug. To, to give you more more information. But, you know, congratulations, kudos to you. And yes, going for your second home, that's important. That's how you're going to continue to build generational wealth for your for your family. Now, because there will be a second home, you know, obviously there will be um, bigger down payment requirements, but, you know, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you on that. Uh, Paul says, sometimes it is the property taxes that add up and create difficulty to afford. Are there programs to reduce property taxes as a way to create affordability? Do you know of any, Imelda? Not that I know of, but I, I wish there was. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we could get away with that. And, and obviously, on newer construction, um, the, the taxes do tend to be higher. You know, we have what's called the Mellow Roofs or special assessments that get added to your traditional property tax bill. And that's something that, unfortunately, we have to pay. I, I, I haven't heard of any ways of reducing it. Um, no. The only time where I saw where you could apply to get a reduction, obviously, was when we went through the market crash of 2008 where values were upside down, where you could actually fill out a form and send it to the tax assessor and they would reevaluate and make an adjustment to your property tax bill. But we're not in that situation. So unfortunately, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Lamella Ruse um, is what uh, is one of the things that exists out there that actually allows for developers to have the economics to build owner-occupied uh, homes today. So it is... Um, you know, it is actually an important tool. Correct. Here's another question here. What are the pros and cons of getting financed through a home builder versus your bank or government loan? Um, the, the pros and cons, obviously, when you go to a home builder, you, the, usually one of the, um, it's not a requirement. They can't make it mandatory. Some buyers think that it, it's mandatory that you must use their in-house lender, and that's not the case. You usually at least have to be pre-qualified with them. They want to make sure and have peace of mind that the buyer that's purchasing this new home is truly qualified. So they will make you get cross-qualified through their in-house lender. However, it is not mandatory, and they cannot force you to use their lender. Um, one of the, um, the advantages of using their in-house lender, 
However, is that normally new builders will give you incentives. Um, a really popular one is that they'll help cover part of your closing costs, if not any, depending on what kind of market we're in, right? Um, right on the market that we're in, you're lucky if you get, you know, a few thousand dollars to be applied towards your closing costs, or sometimes they will let you pick um, upgrades for the house. Um, so that's an advantage. Um, obviously, the disadvantage is that if you're already working with the lender that you're happy with or that maybe was giving you better terms that, you know, you won't be able to use them. Um, but again, like I said, you, you're you not required to use them. If you already have your, your own lender where you bank or if you're a member of a credit union, usually sometimes you get better um, incentives there. So um, always shop around, um, and at the end of the day, the, the consumer has the right to choose the lender that they that they feel comfortable with, and that's going to give them the better terms. Okay, uh, and and then again, Melda, talk a little about the importance of being pre-qualified uh, before you make an offer. Yes, that's really really important, um, especially you know talking from uh, when I'm a listing agent and I'm representing the seller. Um, one of the ways of how I help my sellers make a decision as to which offer is going to be the winning, the winning bidder, right, is making sure that that offer that I get comes from a buyer that has already been pre-approved, not just pre-qualified. A pre-qualification could be done over the phone. I call you, Luis, you're the lender, and I tell you, hey, I want to buy a house. And you ask me a few questions. What kind of credit do you have? And I tell you, oh, I have it in the 700s. This is how much money I make. And based on my information that I give you over the phone, you make the assumption that yes, based on this criteria, Imelda, you qualify for a loan. You know, you're you're qualified. Um, a pre-approval goes a step further, right? Where you, as a lender, are actually going to meet with that borrower, take a full-on application, um, collect all your financial documentation, tax returns, bank statements, um, you know, pay stuff. They verify employment. Um, they do the whole thing, and I'm really picky, so I take it a step further. I want to make sure that that buyer goes through the underwriting process, where the underwriting, um, the underwriter gets their magnifying glass and literally checks everything to make sure that this buyer in question is truly approved, that he doesn't see any obstacles that, you know, could come up. Um, because you'd be surprised, you know, sometimes we get letters and they, they're qualified, we open escrow, and then during the transaction, you know, we find out they haven't verified employment and this person just lost their job or they're about to um, change employment. Or they go and they buy uh, a car and now they're going to get disqualified because their debt to income ratios go out of whack. So it's important that we that a buyer um, works with the lender, like I said, somebody that's really seasoned and that could give them an actual pre-approval, that borrower has to turn in all their documentation, credit has to be run. So when I get offers, I will verify that pre-approval letter and I will call that lender up and ask more questions to make sure that they, they've done their homework and that we're going to be ready to open escrow and just do the the normal stuff, order an appraisal, get a clear, you know, title report and, and to, to try to make it a smooth transaction. Because I, I will have to say that there's no such thing as a smooth real estate transaction. Every transaction will have pickups. There's going to be fires, but you could do so much work at the beginning to avoid headaches and stress on the buyer. At the end of the day, we want to make this a smooth transaction for the buyer. Um, I mean, buying a home is, is, for a lot of people, it's the biggest asset they'll ever purchase in their lifetime. Sure, sure. All right, we are approaching the one hour mark. Uh, ladies, do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Oh, all right, let's get back to, uh, I guess, um, going back to first time home buyers. Uh, how can uh, first time home buyers compete with the high down payment to secure? a property when homes are being purchased by investment companies and paying cash as the down payment. What words of advice do you have? Okay, and that's a tough one, but I mean, I could share some of the things that I've done, right? Which is pretty much um, building good report with the listing agent, um, building good report, picking up the phone and, and telling that other agent how well qualified your buyer is, making sure that when you submit an offer, it's a clean offer and that we submit everything that the listing agent's going to want to see. 
So as a listing agent, I know I, I when I get an offer in and I'm missing proof of funds, I, okay, I'm going to put this one aside. Let me work on the ones that are really ready to go. So doing even little things like that, making sure that you submit your proof of funds, that you submit an updated pre-approval from the lender. And to take an extra step, I always have my lenders. Hey, if Norena's my lender, I'm going to tell Norena, hey, Norena, I just submitted an offer. The listing agent is Lee Cruz. Here's his contact information. This is for buyer Fiona Lung. Um, please make sure you call and tell them how well qualified our buyer is. So taking little extra steps like that, if, if Norena calls you, Luis, and you're the agent, and you're like, oh my God, you know, I just heard from Melda who called me to tell me she submitted an offer, and now I'm hearing from the buyer's lender. You know, little things like that can make your offer stand out. Um, obviously, as an agent, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the property, and I'm not going to ask for things that I don't think are going to be necessary. So if I don't see uh, that the house may have potential termites, for example, I'm not going to ask for a termite inspection on my offer. I'm going to try to keep it as clean as possible. Um, putting a big down payment, even though it's an FHA buyer, so I know it's only three and a half payment as a down payment. So instead of coming in with the traditional, you know, three, five thousand dollar on the on the offer as an earnest deposit, I'm going to tell my buyer and educate them, hey, why don't we come in with a bigger down payment to make your offer look stronger? Because at the end of the day, you're still going to send three and a half percent to escrow if your offer gets accepted. So why not do it in the front? Um, mm -hmm. Reducing your contingency periods. You know, our California state purchase agreement gives the buyers normally 17 days to do inspections, appraisal, to get their loan fully approved. But if I'm working with the lender that's on it, that has already done a lot of the homework up front, I could feel comfortable reducing that inspection in the contract and making it shorter. So that tells the seller that, hey, even though this is an FHA buyer, look at them. They're coming in with a strong earnest deposit. They're reducing their contingencies. They're not asking me for term money. They're not asking me for home warranty. The agent called me. The lender called. Looks like this buyer is ready to go, you know? So doing little things like that can make a buyer's offer stand out. And let me tell you that I've gotten offers accepted with FHA buyers, even when I'm not the one with the highest price. Mm -hmm. I could be conventional cash buyers just because I structure my offer the right way. I took the extra time to call that listing agent to introduce myself. I will even tell them, look at my Google reviews on Zillow so you can know what kind of an agent you're working with. Um, and I have my lender call and also do an introduction. So those little things could really help those first time home buyers stand out even when they're competing against the, the deep pocket investors or people with, that have bigger down payments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good advice. Okay. Uh, what will be the downside of putting a hold on purchasing a home? Uh, people, a lot of people have this question right now. I mean, as you mentioned, it's a tough market. Do you get in or do you hold off? Opportunity cost. Home is not going to, most economists will tell you that there isn't going to be, I think people are waiting for that 2008 to 2012 uh, home depreciation. And we're not likely to see something like that because we have such a low supply of housing. So that's an opportunity cost of wealth that could be created. Uh, that you are, uh, that you're putting off on. I mean, there are some strategies that I've actually seen individuals do, which is to buy their first home actually becomes an investment property. Uh, so perhaps you are able to purchase the investment property in a more affordable market. And then, um, and then you're able to build wealth that way and be in a better position to buy the home that you live in, in the market that in, in the market that you live in the beautiful San Diego. Uh, but those are some strategies that I've seen Okay. But. And in terms of, uh, here's another question related uh, to the lack of, of, of supply. Uh, why not focus uh, uh, more on modular and manufactured construction technology? That's a great question, by the way. There is, uh, if we look at what the big barriers are, we look at zoning, we spoke about zoning uh, a lot uh, earlier today, but the cost of materials and the labor cost and the labor shortages uh, are really driving the costs of, of building homes today. Uh, manufactured homes today are not what they used to be. 
Uh, there is a stigma about manufactured homes that in reality, they are beautiful homes. Uh, and that is, I think, the, the solution to building that entry-level housing stock, building modular homes that are built uh, in a factory, that are built elsewhere, so that you are able to cut costs. I mean, these are all the ways that uh, we need to innovate and that we need to uh, adopt if we're going to build uh, entry-level housing so that people can start building wealth. And it might not be your, you know, your forever home, but it is your, and they're called entry-level housing for a reason. Mm -hmm. But yes, the more that we can do as a city on that issue, uh, I think that's going to be um, that's going to be the way to go. I do want to say I'm going to take my two cents right now. I have some time. Some time. Uh, we have this huge midway redevelopment uh, in there. You know, what are we doing to ensure that there is some entry level housing that's included in that redevelopment? Uh, that is something that is a big topic of conversation in the city today. Uh, something that I uh, I challenge all of you to 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 speak about. You know, we're building homes. We're building affordable, important, affordable housing stock in that huge opportunity for redevelopment. We need to ensure that there's also some opportunities for first time home buyers to be able to uh, get a piece of that land. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Uh, does NAREP have any stats on how many Hispanic older Latinos are homeowners? I don't have it in front of me, but I uh, what I do know is that I mean, the, the home ownership rate is much higher uh, the, the, the older you are. Mm-hmm. And, and if you think about the Latino home ownership rate, uh, home ownership rate and the home ownership story, I want to go back to something I said in the presentation, which is that you can't talk about Latino home ownership without understanding the age of the Latino community. So Latino Latinos have a median uh, age of thirty. So that is uh, so Latinos tend to be younger. Uh, the older you are, the more time that you're able to accumulate assets and wealth. Uh, so the home ownership rate is is uh, is higher at the at the higher age uh, at, at older age, uh, oh. as was mentioned. One thing that's really interesting is that if you look at all demographics and you look at the younger uh, population, so that 18 to 24, the Latino home ownership rate. It, it is is larger than most demographics, uh, and and I find that interesting. I find that that to be. I mean, there's there's an, there's many explanations that could be uh, given on that. It could be that a, a young family members uh, is being placed as the um, as a mortgage holder when it's a family uh, that's purchasing the home. Um, there are. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we uh, attend university, we take out student loans, we have to delay the home buying process. Um, so some of these factors, but I find that interesting. There is also an overwhelming desire for home ownership. Uh, there is no convincing that needs to be made uh, within the Latino community. It's, it's inherent in, 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 in who we are as a community. Uh, that dream of home ownership, that desire is very high uh, within the Latino community. Um, so uh, the age conversation I, I find to be fascinating. Yes, and I will echo with you on that, Marina. I, I have found that a lot of the buyers that I've helped, they come and they're so young. You know, I'm like, oh my God, it's it's I I love it, but you know, because we didn't see that in years past, right? But I have noted that a lot of these Latino buyers that are coming in are very, very young. Yeah, in in young people that want to buy their first home for their parents. Uh, and that's the dream. It's like I want to buy my mom and my dad or my, my family a home. And you know, multiple families, um, multiple incomes contribute to the down to the monthly mm-hmm. payment. Uh, but that's something that we hear a lot that's beautiful. Yes. A couple more questions here. Do you have any data which would show how education level in the Latino population impacts home ownership? Latino home uh, uh, higher education um, rate is the lowest out of any demographic. And that is a, a double-edged sword because if you think about the fact that Latino um, Latinos that go to college are more likely to take on um, a student loan uh, as opposed to uh, the non-Hispanic white population, for example, uh, then um, you are looking at individuals that go to college will likely um, delay their home buying process more. 
So in a weird way, the fact that the Latino homeownership rate is the lowest uh, boosts homeownership uh, rate at the younger age because uh, uh, because they they don't have the student loan uh, debt burden. But obviously, it's a double edged sword because it limits uh, lifelong earning potential and all the opportunities that come with higher education. So it's an interesting data point that we've been diving a little bit more uh, deep in. Uh, it's it's a um, that is a hypothesis. Um, we just know um, those data points, which is that Latinos tend to buy homes younger and uh, Latinos have the lowest uh, higher education rates in the country. Uh, do you see legislation being passed or being structured to help the undocumented with ITINS uh, have access to loans? I actually do know right now that there is some lenders and I actually heard from one of them last week, as a matter of fact, saying that some lenders are beginning to, to do loans for people that have ITIN numbers. And this is just recently, because I know in the past, it seemed like everybody stopped doing them, but I have heard of a couple of lenders so far that are bringing those products back. Okay. Uh, speaking of resources, uh, is there a, a website or uh, an email where people can go to for uh, that have further questions and, and want further information? Sure. So you can ask NAREP, uh, which is uh, press at narep.org for additional questions. We have some resources on our website, but I do want to also point all first time home buyers, especially to uh, the uh, the CFPB's website, I think, is excellent when it comes to uh, guiding individuals through the first home, uh, the, the home buying process. It is one of the most complex uh, financial uh, activities of one's lifetime that people usually make once or twice in their life if they're lucky. Uh, so, consumerfinance.gov is uh, a fantastic website. Uh, that I, I uh, like to share with individuals on. Um, there's a lot of, you know, myths that are dispelled. There's a lot of, um, you know, terminology that's uh, that's defined, steps to go through, things to think about when you want to become a homeowner, and even individuals that are working on bridging the homeownership gap. I think that's there's a lot of great resources there. Great. I'm going to combine these last couple of questions here since we're a little over time. Uh, what is being done to immediately increase opportunities for home ownership? And, uh, you know, you've talked about uh, the, the, the lack of supply, the regulatory restrictions, the cost of materials, uh, even voter resistance to new growth. What, what, are, uh, what can uh, we all do to, I guess, uh, improve the situation? I think continue speaking. Uh, obviously, we are uh, continuing to work with uh, with federal legislators, with our housing agencies, uh, to create programs uh, to ease zoning restrictions. But here at the in, to to work with lenders to create products that are amenable for, to first time home buyers. But at the local level, we need to address this housing supply crisis, uh, and we need to ensure that uh, owner occupied and home ownership opportunities are not left out of the equation. Uh, and so the more, I think one of the things that, um, that um, you know, we forget uh, is that we have a lot of power and our voices are important. Uh, and in those, those conversations with individuals that, I think there is a, a group of individuals that are passionate, a lot of organizations, uh, a lot of individuals. Uh, I think there's many elected officials that are passionate about addressing this issue. We all need to get together and uh, think outside the box about how to solve this enormous issue that we have together. You know, one of the things that I've um, I've been thinking about, well, I was just speaking to, um, I was at a conference um, this past week uh, and I'm seeing how other markets are addressing this issue. For example, the issue of institutional investors. Uh, so there are nonprofits that are, uh, purchasing, uh, using CDFI funding to purchase uh, homes and to become that uh, cash buyer so that they can sell them to first time home buyers. There's, there's things uh, like that that are happening. There are markets that are, because if you think about, there are markets that have historically been critical for, for first time uh, home buyers of color. Uh, there are markets where they, they've historically purchased their first home in. 
Uh, and those are the same markets that we're seeing a lot of institutional investors purchase homes. And we're not talking about, there was that one person that asked a question that is wants to buy you know, investment property that is trying to create wealth. Um, we're talking about the Wall Street institutional investors that are purchasing a massive amount of homes. We're seeing some markets that are creating uh, neighborhood uh, HOAs. And so they're getting together with their um, with their neighborhoods and and creating an HOA uh, that requires um, that it requires that individuals that purchase homes uh, are owner occupants for at least a couple of years uh, when they purchase in that area, especially if they're historically underserved communities. Uh, it, it, and so there's there's a lot of things that people are doing outside of the box around the country that I think we need to put everything on the table, get everyone who's passionate about these issues together, legislators, builders, uh, nonprofits, uh, citizens that wanna become homeowners. We all need to just come together and we need to solve the solution because when great minds get together, we will find a solution. Thank you, no, I don't know. I do appreciate your time. Uh, Melda, anything else you wanna add before we go? No, I agree with Lorena. You know, we we have more power than we think we have, you know, but, you know, and, and there's a lot of us. So if we just join forces, we can make some tremendous positive changes for all our communities and to help our Latinos continue to build generational wealth. Well, I do. On a mission to continue doing that. Love it. Love it. Well, I do want to thank uh, Nuerena Limon, Executive Vice President of Public Policy and Industry Relations at NAREP, and Imelda Manzo, Broker Owner of Premier One Realtors, Past President for NAREP, Temecula Valley, and Regional Director for NAREP's National Advocacy Committee. Thank you both very much for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to those of you who tuned in. This recording will be available at San Diego Union Tribune.com slash NAREP. That's N-A-H-R-E-P. We hope you'll join us for our next special Together San Diego webinar on this topic, where we'll discuss the link between home ownership and wealth creation that will be held on August 25th at 11 a.m. And then we'll have our third webinar discussing navigating buying a home in San Diego uh, on Thursday, September 1st at 11 a.m. We hope to see you then. Have a great so day, everybody. Bye-bye.